We talked about uh, decision tree learning um, and we stopped talking about uh, continuous attributes um, and I mean the algorithm for uh, decision trees only works with discrete attributes. So uh, the first impression is it doesn't work with continuous attributes but uh, the answer is actually the opposite. It works very well with continuous attributes because um, what, uh, what our algorithm does is it produces an appropriate number of discrete attributes out of any continuous attributes. So if we have look at the leukocytes attribute, huh? in LexMate, what we did in LexMate was we manually discretized this attribute and I guess it ended up in uh, seven intervals. Huh? I mean this was just because the doctors, the doctors they said okay we need to have uh, a number of intervals which is greater than two, maybe at least three, but we, we were careful and we said okay let's discretize it into seven intervals, but maybe that was um, too fine a discretization. And what C4.5 does here, it produces the appropriate number of intervals. Okay, so if we take the leukocytes attribute then we get such a node um, which is now a binary attribute. This attribute is leukocytes greater than 11,030 and this is true or false. So we have a, a binary attribute um, and how the question is of course how do we find such a threshold value? Huh? And what we do is we compute the information gain. But, yeah, um, so what we do is look at this, at this formula. We compute the information gain for our data set and such a new binary attribute A greater than some value V. And now what this formula does, it finds the maximum of the information gain for all values v. Yeah? And I mean this would, would uh, in principle be an infinite loop because there are infinitely many possible values v because we want to have a, a continuous attribute. But this is not necessary to really try infinitely many v. What we, uh, so one approach to make this finite is we use all values v that occur in the data and of course there are at most as many values v uh, as we have training data. So if we have 10,000 training data which is uh, quite a large number then um, we have to, to test at most 10,000 v values. Huh? So that would mean we would have to compute the information gain 10,000 times. Uh, but I mean this is not too much effort, so this is uh, with no problems uh, doable. Okay, so what we do is we compute the information gain for all values v and then we use this value v which gives us uh, the highest information gain. And this is then our threshold theta. And now the important point is what you read here in green uh, is each continuous attribute is tested whenever I produce a new node in the, in the construction of the tree. So it may in an extreme case uh, happen that the whole tree consists just of this one continuous attribute but with different uh, thresholds. So out of one continuous attribute we may produce 20 uh, discrete attributes which occur very often in the tree.
Okay, so much about continuous attributes. And now let's talk about pruning. Uh, pruning is cutting the tree. Uh, um, now, why do we do pruning after we produce a tree? Yeah, the, 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 the point is the tree may be too large. Uh, and this is not so good for a couple of reasons. Uh, um, yeah, now let's cite two famous scientists. First, Aristotle, um, from two scientific theories which explain the same situation equally well, the simpler one is preferred. So you see uh, already the Greek uh, preferred simpler theories, but this is not surprising. Uh, um, because simpler theories are easier to understand, the chance to make errors is smaller, and so on. Uh, um, and um, yeah, from this we can infer the so-called Occam's razor rule. From all trees with a fixed error rate, the smallest tree has to be chosen. Uh, so after C45 produces my tree, there is the question, maybe there is a smaller tree which has the same or even a smaller error rate. Uh, yeah. And due to uh, this, uh, I mean, this, this rule, which already stems from Aristoteles, um, this is also called the Occam's razor. Occam's razor is quite general. It, it's not only for decision tree learning. Um, Occam's razor, uh, I mean, Occam was a, a philosopher, um, and uh, his, uh, he was not talking about machine learning because there was no machine learning at that time. He was talking about scientific theories, and uh, he was actually saying the same thing as Aristoteles did. Yeah? But applied to our uh, machine learning example here, uh, we have to select the smallest tree uh, for a fixed error rate. Uh -huh. Okay, so I mean, of course, what we want, the, our primary goal is to have a tree with a, uh, an error rate which is as small as possible. Uh -huh. But among all the trees with a minimum error rate, we want to select uh, a smallest tree. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and also, I mean, this pruning has to do with generalization. When I produce a really large tree, then this large tree uh, does kind of road learning. Uh, road learning is in German auswendig lernen. Uh, so it stores, it stores all the cases that are apparent in our training data. Uh, but then, if I just store all the cases, it will be difficult for me to generalize to new unseen cases. Because, for example, I may just learn noise. I may learn random noise. Uh, um, so if my structure in which I store the data, of course here it's a tree, but in other learning algorithms it may be different. If this structure is too complex, then this structure may allow to store all the training data and even store noise. And then this, of course, is a problem for generalizing. Uh, so our our structure, our learning structure, may not be too big. We want to restrict it. Uh, so it, it should be kind of a bottleneck uh, in order to prevent storing random noise. Uh. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, we, we already talked last time about this strategy to use for the learning for learning um, a training data set, which may be two thirds of all data, and for testing we use a separate test data set, and this I mean this splitting up of 
training data and test data is called cross-validation. Huh? Cross-validation because we use this set, set for training and another set where we do the cross-validation on for testing. Okay. And this is very important for avoiding overfitting. Because if I use my training data and then I test the performance on the training data, then I may get extreme overfitting. Huh? But if I use different test data, then of course my algorithm must be able to generalize. Huh? Okay, yeah, and now let's look at this, at this picture, which is quite uh, important. So what we uh, have here is the tree size. And the tree size corresponds to the complexity of the model. Huh? So we are, we're having uh, an extremely simple model up to a very complex model. And here we have the relative error. Huh? And this relative error, of course, we want to, uh, to, uh, to have an error which is as small as possible. Um, yeah, and now here we have this curve is the error on the training data. And as you can see, the larger our tree becomes the smaller our training data, uh, our uh, error on the training data becomes. Maybe it would go down even further if we enlarge the tree even more. Now, let's look at the error on the test data, which is this curve here. And here you can see that there is a minimum, which is here. So the error decreases up to a, a certain point. So the tree size is here something like 55 uh, nodes. And then the error increases again. What's the reason for that? Why does the error increase for, for, for larger trees? Yeah, the reason is overfitting. The reason is overfitting. I mean, look, the error on the test uh, on the training data decreases for larger trees, even beyond this point. Huh? But what we see here, this shows us that what happens here is just storing random noise. Huh? So we store random noise in our tree and random noise, of course, does not help us um, solving unseen new problems. Yeah, and therefore it is very important that we do the testing on unseen test data and now um, based on this graph we can actually uh, select the appropriate tree size, which would be here something around 55. But now let me, let me look into the book. Don't we have a different graph there? Oh yes, oh, okay, everything is the same, yeah, fine. 
Okay, so th yeah, this is very important. Huh? Um, and what happens in C4.5 is it produces quite a large tree. Depending on this M parameter, the tree size may be 200. Huh? The, or the, the size of the full tree. And now, um, I mean, one procedure um, to find the appropriate tree size could be the following. We do our learning, and while the tree increases, we test um, on our training data and we see the arrow goes down. But at the same time, in parallel, we do a test on our test data and we always store the error. And here we see the error is something like 22.4%. And then we see from here on the error on the test data continuously increases. Huh? And that means now we learn, okay, we've gone too far, so we go back to this point where we had the minimum error. This would be one procedure, and there are uh, decision tree learning algorithms which do it in such a way. For example, the card system does it in a way similar to this. But what C4.5 and most other algorithms does is it first produces a large tree, that's what you see, what you saw last time when we applied C4.5. You first see the decision tree generated, and then comes a new tree, which is called the simplified decision tree. Yeah, and what happens is, yeah, let me show it here. So we go down, oh no, yeah. Okay, we go down to this point and we get a tree which is too large. Huh? And then we do the pruning. Pruning means from the leaf nodes on, we start cutting away uh, um, nodes in the tree. Huh? Um, and this may happen, I mean, this, this cutting doesn't lead us back along, so it doesn't produce like that. Huh? That's what we do not get. We get something different. Maybe we get something like that and like this. And we finally may end in a, at a point which is close to this one. Huh? That's how, how it works in C4.5. Huh? So these are two different ways. But and I can't tell you which one is better. This is, in some uh, cases, this is better, and in some cases, the other method is better. But C, C4.5 uses pruning, so we get something like that, and finally we end up in a tree uh, which has. Um, Or should we? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 yeah, we should also show the curve for the error on the test data, which is even more, even more relevant. Yeah? So now we start from here. So while we prune our tree, then we get something uh, here, which is. Um, yeah, which may look like that. Huh? So what happens while C4.5 prunes the tree? We have produced this tree which is too large. Huh? And now we cut off parts of the tree as long as, and this is actually not nice, we, we, I should draw a new curve because now here, uh, C4.5 would stop at this point. Maybe there is also a little built-in threshold such that such a very tiny minima would not be uh, used. But, yeah, let's delete this. Okay, so it, 
should look something like that. So it gradually, continually goes down until we end uh, somewhere here. And now, how, why would this stop here? Because um, further pruning would then increase the error again. Huh? That's why would we would stop at this point. Uh -huh. Yeah. And what you can see, which is an indication of um, severe overfitting, uh, an indication of severe overfitting is if the difference between the error on the test data and on the training data is quite big. Uh, so here we have a little more than 20% error, and here we have 24% error. Uh, um, but here, so if you look at these two points, you see it's only about 0.5% difference, and here it is 3.5% um, difference. Uh. So here we have overfitting, um, but here no longer, or here, because these two points are quite close together. Yeah. I mean, this notion of overfitting is very important for any machine learning algorithm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Here, here we have a definition of over of the overfitting term. Let a specific learning algorithm that is a learning agent be given. We call an agent A overfit to the training data if there is another agent overfit to the training data. What's that? This is not correct. Overfit, yeah, I, we call an agent A, I would say to overfit the training data if there is another agent A prime whose error on the training data is larger than that of A, but whose error on the whole distribution of data is smaller than the error of A. Okay, yeah, so we should look at this again. So we are now talking about two different learning agents. Huh? So we can, for example, think of uh, C4.5 without pruning and C4.5 with pruning. Huh? And now the agent without pruning overfits the training data if there is another agent, a prime, whose error on the training data is larger than that of A, but whose error on the whole distribution of data is smaller. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So take the, the, the large tree without pruning. Yeah. This tree overfits because there is another agent uh, which is the algorithm with pruning, which has on the training data larger error, but on the test data the error is, small, is smaller. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and cross-validation, we already talked about that. Um, okay, pruning in C4.5. Yeah, that's what we talked about already. Oh yes, and it's very important that um, pruning is a greedy algorithm. Huh? We have already seen a greedy algorithm when we talked about search algorithms. Huh? Um, 
who remembers what the greedy algorithm does and also what's the disadvantage of the greedy algorithm? The greedy algorithm was the first algorithm I introduced when we talked about heuristic search. What does the greedy algorithm do? Whenever we have the choice to expand a node, then we greedily select the node among the successor nodes, we select that node which has um, the smallest heuristic evaluation. So that node which seems to be the best. Huh? But actually uh, this greedy procedure is not optimal. You know an optimal algorithm which is A star. Huh? What's the reason why A star is, is better than greedy? If we are here and the question is which one among these successor nodes should we now select, then Greedy just looks which one is the best guy among these successor nodes, okay? But it does not consider the whole picture. It just locally decides, okay, this one seems to be the best. But maybe it would have been better to go back and expand here. And then of course we would have, um, not of course, but then maybe we would have here a much better solution. But by just looking locally here, uh, the greedy algorithm uh, doesn't find the best solution. And this is similar in our pruning process of C4.5. Now let's look, suppose this is a, a decision tree, no longer a search tree. Yeah? This is a decision tree produced by C4.5. And yeah, suppose we have some uh, parts here. Okay, suppose this is our whole tree. And now what, what the pruning algorithm does, it actually randomly selects nodes. Yeah? So it may select this node, and it, it, this may be. And we, we now what, what do we do? How do we decide whether we cut this node or not? How do we decide this? I just told you before. How do we decide whether we cut off the node or not? We test the performance of the tree with the node on our test data and then we cut off the node and test the performance of the tree which is smaller on the same test data and now we will only cut the node if the performance of the pruned tree is better. Okay, so now we cut off, we have cut this node away. Okay, and now we, we we uh, randomly select some other node. It may even be an inner node, for example this one. Now we cut off this node, which of course means cutting off the whole subtree. And if the performance after cutting this whole subtree is better, 
then we really cut, uh, cut away everything down here. And so on. It may end with a tree which only consists of the root node. But it also may end with maybe this tree. And now the question is, is this the optimal tree? Is this the best tree? I mean, the algorithm, the pruning algorithm stops if cutting any, uh, any node here increases the, the, the error on the test data. So that, yeah, that seems to be optimal because I can't do any further pruning without increasing the error. So this seems to be optimal or not. Maybe the error might increase and decrease afterwards. So um, oh, may that be the case? Oh, that's a good question. So he, what he says is, it might happen that, for example, we cut this tree. And after cut uh, this node, after cutting this node, the error increases but further on it may decrease again. I guess this is not possible. But I'm not sure. It may, it may, it may well be true. Um, but another case may also occur. Suppose, um, so suppose it, we, 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 uh, there is no further decrease of the error once we cut any nodes. Oh yes, yes, okay, now I, I have the argument. So what C4.5 does, I already told you, it does not only try to cut off uh, leaf nodes, it tries all nodes in the tree. So what you said, suppose the error increases when we cut this away, but then it decreases once we cut this one, this was already tested because C4.5 tries to cut off all nodes, so it already tested to cut off this node. So we cannot, we cannot improve the performance by cutting any nodes from this tree. But we might improve the performance by uh, getting back maybe this node and maybe these nodes. Huh? We may get a better performance with the tree that keeps these nodes but maybe deletes this guy. What we did was a greedy removal of nodes from the tree. We greedily deleted nodes. And greedy means when we have deleted a node, we are not allowed to uh, introduce it again. This is not allowed. That's the, uh, the, yeah, the, the meaning of greedy. Uh? Greedy means whenever we tried something, we don't do any backtracking. So, yeah. What would be an optimal procedure? Let's talk about what would be the optimal pruning procedure. That's easy. We would, we would take our large tree that the algorithm produces and then we uh, test the performance of all subtrees of this large tree that was produced. That's, that would be the optimal pruning algorithm. 
Why don't we apply this in C4.5? Yeah, suppose you have seen examples where the, the unpruned tree was really large. It had thousands of nodes. And now the, the number of subtrees of a tree with thousands of nodes uh, is extremely large. Yeah? That's, I mean, the, the order of magnitude is about as much as the number of subsets of a set. Now, how many subsets has a set with n elements? What's the number of subsets of a set with n elements? I mean, the, the set containing all subsets is called the power set. How large is the power set of a set? So, if you don't understand the English terms in German, we are talking about the Potenzmenge einer Menge. Huh? Menge aller Teilmengen einer Menge. How many subsets are for a set of size n? N factorial. Yeah, n factorial. So you see, if our, our tree has 1,000 nodes, then there is 1,000 factorial different subsets. The number of subtrees is not as large as this, but almost. Huh? So you see, there is no chance. There is no chance to test all the subtrees for large trees. And that's why we use such a greedy procedure. Huh? Because the greedy procedure, the effort of the greedy procedure, how much, uh, so how does the uh, computation time for the greedy procedure increase with uh, the size of the tree? I mean, this shouldn't be difficult. Actually, the greedy procedure, the greedy procedure is very similar to what uh, a gardener does with a real tree out there. Take one of these trees, and then there comes the tree cutter. Huh? How does his effort, uh, I mean the, the time he, it takes him, um, increase with the number of uh, branches the, the tree has? Does it grow linearly or exponentially or uh, with uh, n factorial? How does it grow with the number of branches in the worst case? Yeah, linearly, of course. Because once this tree cutter has cut off one tree, there is no chance to cut this tree a second time. Huh? Ah, sorry, this branch. As soon as I cut one branch, this branch is cut off and I can't do it a second time. Huh? So at most linearly. I mean, I could do it even in constant time. If I cut just at the root of the tree, then there is only one cut. But in the worst case, if I cut every little tiny branch for itself, um, it's just n. Okay? And that's what we have here too. The greedy procedure, uh, the, the, the time scales linearly with the size of the original tree, which is uh, quite fast. This is very fast, so that's, that's no problem at all. But if we would look at all subtrees, then the complexity would be much worse, and this is intractable. That's why we use this uh, greedy tree cutting. Okay, yes, and also I guess I forgot to mention this. When we talked about the algorithm that builds up the tree, yeah, let's look back to the algorithm. Here we have it. This learning algorithm 
is a greedy algorithm too. This learning algorithm does by no means produce the best tree. Why is this a greedy algorithm? And there is a simple answer. Because it does not um, try all different trees for our given variables. Suppose we have variables attributes a1 through a K. And now what does this algorithm do? Look, it looks for the attribute with maximum information gain. Suppose it would be A3. And then we start our tree with A, A3. Then we expand this node. And here, again, we look for the attributes, here the attribute with highest information gain, which may be a 1, and this may be a 7, and this may be a 25, maybe. Huh? But how about the tree looking like a 22? starting with that and continuing somehow. We never looked at this tree. Once we started with this tree because this node had the highest information gain, we would never look at this tree. And can you guarantee that this is the optimal tree? No, you can't. Because what we did here, we did a local a local choice. Huh? Our local choice was to, to use the attribute with highest information gain. But this is just a local decision at this root of the tree. Maybe it would have been better to use attribute A22 and then some uh, subtrees. Huh? Who knows? We can't guarantee. So. <clears throat> the point is, this is a heuristic procedure. And it is a greedy procedure. Because once we selected this attribute here, we would never do a backtracking again and try other alternatives. And unfortunately, there is no proof that this local greedy procedure is optimal. There are actually counterexamples, so one can produce example data sets where selecting the attribute with highest information gain here does not produce the optimal tree. Okay, so um, building up the tree with the learning algorithm is a greedy procedure and the pruning algorithm also is a greedy procedure. Huh? So we have no guarantee to find the optimal tree. Oh yeah, let's talk about, I mean, now I really expe expect an answer from somebody uh, from you. Um, can you describe an optimal learning algorithm? which allows us to find the optimal tree. <coughs> Suppose we are given our k different attributes. Huh? I think we have to create all possible trees and evaluate them. Yes, that's it. That's the procedure. 
The only question might be, are there probably infinitely many trees? If this is the case, then we are not able to produce all of them. But this is not. There are only a finite number of trees. Why? I mean, let's make things simpler and assume all these attributes are discrete. Huh? No continuous attributes. But in this case, the number of trees is finite. What do we need to show for this? We need to show that the depth is finite and the branching factor is finite. If these two are finite, then the number of trees is finite. Okay, why is the branching factor finite? Because our attributes are discrete. Yes, and discrete means all attributes have a finite number of values and this leads to a finite branching factor. And why is the depth of the tree finite? Yes, that's it. Because we have a finite number of attributes and in any part in the tree, the number of attributes in any part cannot be bigger than the total number of attributes. Because it does not make sense to use a discrete attribute twice. Huh? I mean, if this is not obvious to you, uh, the question, why does it make no sense to use a discrete attribute twice? If this is not clear to you, then write it down as an exercise and just try it on some examples and you will immediately see why it makes no sense to use a, dis a discrete attribute twice. Okay, oh yeah, this is our next uh, little section, uh, missing values. Now, suppose in our training data set, this is one of the lines in our LexMate uh, uh, data file. So this is one case, one training sample, and here we have a missing value. I mean, there are, there are many reasons why uh, values are missing. One reason is that during examination of the patient, we didn't get this value due to some reason. Huh? Or maybe there was a typing error somewhere and we couldn't read it, whatever. Huh? Missing values are quite common in training data. How can we uh, treat data with missing values? The simplest approach is we just delete all the cases with missing values. Huh? But as you can see in this example, even with this missing value, there is some information in this sample. So maybe we would like to exploit the information that we still have. Huh? And now what we can do is we just assign a value here huh? because, I mean, C4.5 needs all the values. And what we can do is we assign to this attribute the most frequent value from the whole data set. Huh? <coughs> um, or we could do something better. We assign uh, the most frequent value from the same class. So we take among all data which have the one here at the end uh, the most frequent value which would be a better approximation. No? Or what we also could do is we could um, we could use a probability distribution. No? 
Um, now, what does that mean? We don't know this value. This is, this is the second fever value. Huh? Um, and now we could look at all the samples with the same class. With the same class. And then if we look at all the samples with the same class, we would get a probability distribution. So if we look at the, I mean, this would be the class up um, equal one. So that means the positive uh, training data. And now the fever values, they go from, I don't know, uh, maybe 34 up to 42. And then we get some probability distribution, distribution P, uh, yeah, probability. And we have, uh, so for the inflamed appendix, so we do have uh, 37 here, and maybe it would be something like that. The maximum would be to the right of 37. Huh? Okay, but for this, training sample, we don't know the value. The value may be one, uh, one value in this interval. And now we just replace the question mark by this probability distribution. Oh, um, yes, but we are, we are still in discrete worlds. So um, we only have discrete attributes. So that would be then 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. So we have, may have a probability distribution which may look like that. Such a discrete probability distribution. And now, I mean, we have some value like uh, point zero 0.02 here and point zero 0.05 here and so on. And now we would replace the question mark by... Now, we would replace this training sample by um, one... What is it? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. As many new samples as we do have values for the missing attribute. So if this attribute has eight different values, then we would um, replace this one sample by eight new samples. Huh? In sample number one, we replace the question mark by 34. But we assign to this sample a probability of 0 0.02. And for the next sample, we have the next value, which is uh, 35, with this probability, and so on. Huh? I mean, this is actually the best we can do. Huh? Because this representation now contains all our uncertainty we have about this attribute. Yeah? Um, and now what you can see is we do have now, um, I mean these samples, one sample corresponds to one patient that was treated in the clinic. But now we split this sample up into, for example, eight new ones. Huh? Um, so we, and, and sample number one only has a weight of 0 0.02, so this is just a fraction of a sample. So this is a 0 0.02 sample, and the next one is a 0 0.05 sample, and so on. So this is not one sample, it's just uh, a fraction of a sample. And that's the reason why when you look at decision trees that C4.5 generates, 
you see fractional numbers of samples. Let's look back at such a decision tree here. I mean, such a number here means there is a decision appendicitis 1. So the class 1, this patient is inflamed. And this decision is based on 160.1 samples. 79 out of which um, are the opposite, would be uh, uh, zero. Uh, so you see the majority is one. But the interesting point is this point one and this point seven. What does that mean? I mean, based on our, our data set, we only have integer samples. But once we replace our uh, samples with missing values, then we get uh, fractional new samples. Uh, and that's why you see these fractions here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's how missing values are being treated um, during learning. So during learning, we just replace our samples by fractional samples and then, of course, when we, when we apply some algorithms or formulas, uh, these samples will always be weighted with these probabilities. Uh, and uh, in an analogous way, the samples are treated during classification. So suppose we are finished and we produced our decision tree. Uh, and now we want to classify a patient where we do not know this second fever value. And then we just replace this value by the probability distribution. And then, I mean, that's quite interesting. What would then happen? Suppose this is our decision tree. And we ask for attribute A1 and then A2 here, for example. Or let's say maybe this is A3. Um, And, and now here comes um, A7. And suppose this is the missing, the missing attribute value. So our patient, we do not know this value. So we do not know the value of this attribute. Here we have V1 and here we have V2. We don't know whether it's V1 or whether it's V2. If we would know it, we would just proceed down the, the branch and then finally find a, a leaf node. But since we do not know this value, we just use the probability distribution. So suppose here we have a probability of 0 0.6 and here we have a p of 0 0.4. Then we would proceed down both the branches we would proceed down this branch with a probability of 0.6 and this branch with a probability of 0.4. And then, maybe down here, we have a decision out of uh, 100 cases. Um, so, yeah, C4.5 would say one, 100 and um, let's say 30. Uh, and here we get a decision of 200 and uh, um, uh, 70. So that means 70 out of the 100 here um, tell you, okay, appendicitis equal 1. And uh, 130 out of these tell you appendicitis 1. Okay, I mean here the decision is simple. We say appendicitis 2. But if, I mean, if it would be the other way around, if we would have, for example, 170 here, then we would, we would take this probability and this probability and then add them up based on these weights here. And then take a look what is the final decision. OK, 
Okay, so we can treat missing values. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, now we, we know everything about how um, decision tree learning works. Okay, yeah, summary. It's meanwhile a very popular method for classification tasks. That's very important. It only works for classification. It does not work for approximation because, I mean, it is a discrete tree. Yeah? And down when I'm at a leaf node, I have to take a decision. Yeah? Okay, it's easy to use. You have seen it. Um, it's very fast. As an example, on our LexMate data, with 10,000 training data records and 15 attributes, it takes uh, 0.3 seconds for learning. This is extremely fast. Huh? If you would compare this with a neural network, if you have 10,000 tra training data on 15 attributes, that may take you hours, even days of learning time. Huh? Um, yeah, and this is very important too. Irrelevant attributes are removed automatically. Maybe this is not yet obvious to you. If we have our, let's say, 15 attributes in LexMate, then our decision tree may cont contain only three attributes. We have seen such trees. We have seen trees where we used only one attribute just the leukocyte value. We have even seen trees where we use no attribute at all. And this is extremely helpful because, yeah, let's compare it with the neural network again. Neural networks, they have no inherent attribute selection mechanism. So if you design a neural network with 15, so you have 15 attributes, then um, you use 15 input neurons and your neural network works based on all 15 attributes. Even so, it co of course, it may be the case that only three out of these 15 are relevant and all the others, they are just redundant. They give you nothing new. So you would then have a, a neural network which is by far too complex. Maybe your neural network would uh, hopefully put all the weights related to irre irrelevant attributes would put them to zero huh? but uh, this cannot be a guaranteed but the decision tree algorithm it removes the attributes which are not relevant what is the reason or how does it remove the irrelevant attributes how does that work Maybe you look at the, um, the algorithm um, that produces the tree. I mean, you also may look at some of the resulting trees in the LexMed example. They don't use all attributes especially if you look at the smaller trees. Where does that come from? If you look at the algorithm, then there is some if-then-else uh, branching uh, where we decide 
whether to pro uh, we produce a new node or not. Where is this decision in this algorithm? Where is the decision um, to produce a new node or not? It's here. If the information gain of my new attribute is zero, then um, so now, if the information gain of the best attribute is zero, then our node becomes a leaf node, and that's it. So if at some point in the tree I test all the attributes, but the information gain of all attributes is zero, then of course I don't continue expanding the tree. That's the important thing. So using our information gain entropy measure helps us to produce, uh, to use only attributes that really give an information gain. That's the point. And that's very important. So you do not, you do not need to manually select a set of attributes. And this is in many um, applications very, very helpful. Suppose we take the Lexmate example and suppose there is not a doctor who tells me I would use these 15 attributes. But I just read some books and then there is this leukocyte value and then maybe there are, I mean, there are already 100 or even more different um, numbers than I, that I can get from the blood. Yeah? Some other blood counts. Yeah? And maybe I just introduce all I get. Yeah? But then um, our decision tree algorithm would immediately see all these other uh, um, blood counts are not relevant, so they wouldn't be used in the tree. But suppose you have uh, not 15 attributes, but maybe 200, because you have no idea about the, the application, and you would produce a neural network, that would be really bad. So this is a, a very, very uh, important strength of this algorithm. Okay, and this also is very important the user can understand the decision tree. I mean, for everybody, no matter whether this person has a mathematical education or not, it is easy to understand the decision tree. I remember one, when I was 18 and I bought my first car, it was a Kadett B, Baujahr 70. Huh? Um, and I bought such a little book, uh, it was called Wie helfe ich mir selbst. Huh? Uh, reparatur of uh, uh, the car repair book. Huh? And at the end of this car repair book there was a decision tree. Um, so if the car doesn't start, then check whether there is fuel in the tank. Huh? If there is no fuel, fill it up. Huh? If there is fuel, check whether uh, there is a battery in the car. If there is no battery, put one in and so on. Yeah? So well, that was really easy to, to understand. So everybody can understand such a decision tree, which is very important because sometimes the user really is interested in the knowledge. Sometimes not, but if you are interested in the knowledge, then this is very helpful. For example, um, in many data mining applications, the user wants to know, for example, about the shopping behavior of a customer on the Amazon website, and uh, a decision tree explicitly uh, shows us, for example, the shopping behavior of the customers. Okay, 
And when the user has understood the decision tree, he may be happy about the tree, but he may be happy, unhappy about some parts of the tree, and then the user can even manually change the tree. Huh? Manually modify the tree. This is very important too. And now also, or again, compare this to a neural network. First, the user has no chance to understand the structure of the neural network. Since it ha he has no chance, there is of course no chance at all to modify the neural network in order to become better. Yeah, next advantage is the decision tree can easily be integrated into existing programs. Huh? I mean the decision tree, if you look at such a tree, this is nothing but an if-then-else cascade. If attribute A1 is equal to value 1, then. If A2 is equal to value 1, then, and so on. So it's just a cascade of if-then-else uh, branchings. Um, and so implementation in a program is no problem at all. And it's extremely fast. Why is it extremely fast? Because the computation time is just linear in the depth of the tree. And the depth of the tree is about the same as the number of attributes. So even if we have 100 attributes, which is quite a lot, the depth of the tree is not bigger than 100, and 100 if-then-else decisions that costs no computational time. I mean, this still is, uh, I don't know, way below a microsecond. Okay, yeah. And how, I mean, of course, this, this decision tree is, if you look at our C4.5 decision trees, they are represented in such an indentation manner, and then, of course, you would you would need to write a program that transforms this tree into an if-then-else cascade, but this is not, uh, not really an issue. Huh? You, could, you could also do inside the source code of our decision tree generator, uh, produce uh, a different uh, printing algorithm for printing the tree, and then you would immediately have your, your executable, or not executable, you would immediately have the source code of a program which you would then need to compile, and uh, you can easily integrate it into any existing programs. Okay, yeah, this, our, I already mentioned this, the trees are not always optimal. Huh? There is no guarantee that our decision trees are optimal, so this is a heuristic, uh, a heuristic algorithm, but producing an optimal tree is impossible. I mean, not always, but as soon as the number of attributes and training data is not extremely small, we cannot enumerate all possible trees. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so that's actually all I uh, had to say about decision trees. Any questions? I mean, this was one of the most important sections um, in terms of AI applications and engineering of AI or in AI. Because of these uh, reasons I mentioned. Okay, so now um, we go uh, back a little bit into Bayesian networks. We could have done this before when we talked about Bayesian networks, but we didn't know about machine learning enough. So now we do have our machine learning basics, and we ask ourselves how can we learn a Bayesian network? Yeah? Um, 
And there are two parts. You have seen it when we talked about this alarm example. The first step is to find the network structure. We discussed it how we do this manually. Huh? First, produce the network structure. Uh, once you have this structure, then um, in the second step, we just need to fill in the probability values into our conditional probability tables. Huh? Let's start talking about this second step. Huh? Um, this second step can be easily done automatically. How does that work? What's up? You're so quiet today. Was it a, a hard weekend? Many parties? How does it work to fill up automatically all our CPTs when the structure is known? It's already written here on the slide. If enough training data is available, all necessary conditional probabilities can be estimated by counting the frequencies in the data. That's what you have to do. And then you get all the values in your CPTs. Okay, yeah, so now that, then let's get back to this uh, step number one which is more difficult, learning the network structure. No? Um, I mean, this is a similar problem to what we had here. We were talking about which would be the optimal decision tree algorithm. The optimal algorithm would evaluate, enumerate, would enumerate all possible trees. From this finite number of trees, we would enumerate all of them and then just test them on our test data. Why, do we, why don't we do it here in the same way? We enumerate all Bayesian networks. We have a finite number of variables. And now we just write down all the variables we do that? Suppose we have five variables, v1, v2, v3, v4, and v5. Okay, I mean this is not, not difficult to write down n nodes when I have n variables. Now the interesting question is now, what is now the next question? when we talk about a directed Bayesian network. And when we talk about the structure of such a network. I mean, what is missing? What is missing here? Hey, what did you do the whole semester? What is missing here? Is this a Bayesian network? Yes, it is a Bayesian network, but it's a, a really boring, trivial Bayesian network. What is missing for this network to become interesting? The relations between the nodes, and how would I draw these relations? Arrows. By arrows, yeah. So we would have some directed edges, maybe like that. <coughs> okay, and um,
I mean, I could now, um, yeah, I could now try to produce a fully connected uh, network. Yeah? And uh, how about this one? And maybe I'm still missing, I, I'm, I'm quite sure I'm still missing a number of uh, arrows. And we have to be careful because cycles are not allowed and so on. Um, but even with only five nodes, you can imagine that the number of Bayesian networks that with directed edges becomes quite big. Huh? It's the same problem we had before. Huh? Um, yes. So we cannot, in realistic applications, with a lot of variables, we cannot produce all Bayesian network graph structures. But if we could, if we could do that, suppose we could it, we would have enough time and, and with five nodes it is possible. Huh? With five nodes we can automatically produce all such directed graphs, directed acyclic graphs. We could automatically produce all these graphs. Um, then, for each one of these graphs, what do we do next? What's next? Here yeah, we do step number two. We learn the pro conditional probabilities that we need for our CPTs. We just fill up the CPTs by counting frequencies on the data. That's what we do for each one of these um, directed graphs. And then what is step number three? I mean, now we have produced maybe 10,000 different uh, Bayesian networks. Okay, and there is your customer who wants to have one Bayesian network. I mean, you could uh, throw all the 10,000 at your customer, but he wouldn't be happy. He wants to have one solution from you. Which one would you give him? You would do the same thing we did, we just did with our decision trees. What did we do? How do we select among these many possible decision trees the best one? Which is, what is our notion of best, best learned model? The network with the lowest error of the training data. Uh, the the test on the test data, yes, that's it. So we test, we, we, produ we first produce all these 10,000 um, directed graphs. Then we fill in the CPTs. And then we test each one of them on our test data. And we will sell this Bayesian network to our customer, which gives us uh, the lowest uh, error on the test data. That's basically the procedure, okay? But unfortunately it does not work because there may be too many networks and we don't have the computational resources. So we again need some greedy procedure. And there is I mean, this learning of Bayesian networks is still um, a serious research topic. So, we don't have really optimal procedures. Uh, so, there is nothing which is comparable to what we have seen with decision trees. Decision tree, this, that's a procedure uh, that everybody uses nowadays. Yeah? 
uh, if you buy a, um, a data mining tool, they all come with decision tree learning. But most of them don't have anything about learning Bayesian networks because it doesn't really work perfectly. But I will show you a simple, a simple algorithm. Uh, yeah, this, this algorithm was uh, or is presented in Finn Jensen's book about Bayesian networks. Uh, um, yeah. Okay, so given our n variables, v1 through vn, uh, um, and of course also a file with training data. That's what we need. Uh. Uh, that's what we need, yeah. and uh, now we are looking for such a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, which represents the underlying probability distribution as well as possible. What does it mean, the underlying distri uh, distribution? It means, of course, the distribution that is inherent, in, or no, that is, uh, I mean, we mean the distribution that our training data are taken from. Our training data are a finite set of samples from some realistic distribution. Uh? Okay, ah, and here you see, uh, the, uh, so I computed the number of DAGs. If we have five nodes, there are already 29,281 different decks. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think, uh, uh, if you look at this uh, picture, at nine nodes we get 10 to the power 15 decks. So you see there is no chance to do the, uh, the full exhaustive search. Okay, yeah. So we do some search in the space of the all DAGs first, then for each DAG we estimate the values of the CPTs, that's easy, and from that we calculate the distribution. Yeah. Once I have my DAG and the CPTs, then I can compute the, the full distribution because I have full knowledge. Then when I have the distribution, then, I mean, this is a nice idea. What I now do is, I do have the distribution of my Bayesian network. Yeah? Um, and I also can estimate the distribution from our training data. And now we compare these two distributions. Yeah? Um, yeah. Um, and comparing two distributions means determine the distance of the distribution, so of our calculated distribution, to the distribution known from the data. Uh, and I will do this for all our, whatever, 29,000 different basin networks. And then we would uh, select the Bayesian network where the distance between the network distribution and the data distribution is the smallest. Huh? Okay, yeah, and here we have an example. Um, yeah, that, let me see how much time does it take us. Yeah, we, ca we can just look at the example. This is the, uh, the example you, also, you already hopefully have seen in the exercises, which was our weather example. Huh? Um, so we have these uh, uh, three variables um, and uh, so uh, the weather of, of a day is described by the sky, whether it's clear or uh, um, cloudy. Then there is the barometric uh, trend, whether it's increasing or falling, um, and the precipitation, which means is it raining or not. Yeah? So we do have these uh, three variables um, and we do have a distribution. Uh, and we have three, three, um, um, three binary variables which gives us um, 2 to the power 3 um, yeah, 2 to the power 3 different values in our distribution. 
which are all combinations uh, in the truth table for three binary variables. This is our distribution we have. So this is our empirical distribution on the data. Huh? And now we, we can produce out of the networks with three nodes in this example, we just use two. Now we use this network and we use this network. And now what we do is we compute the difference between the distribution of this network to, our, to the distribution of the training data and the distribution of this network to the training data. Uh, um, of course, first we, we uh, fill in our CPTs for this network and for this network and then we get the distribution. And now we could, for example, use the Euclidean difference on vectors. I mean, this is a vector, one distribution, then we get the vector for this distribution and we use the Euclidean distance uh, between this distribution and this and also between this and this. And now what we get is the distance for network A, this one, um, to this distribution is 0 0.0029 and for network number 2, which is this one, to the distribution is 0 0.014. So you see network A is better because the distribution is much closer to the original one than network B. Okay, I mean, we could also use a different uh, distance metric. This is the Euclidean metric, but for, di for probability distribution, there is the so-called kullback liebler divergence, um, which is a formula based on the entropy formula. Look, I want to uh, compute the distance between a vector x, a probability vector x, and a probability vector y, then what do we have? The sum over i, y i, log y i. If you only take this part, this is the entropy of this y distribution. And now this is, uh, I mean it's also called a cross entropy. What do, what do we have here? We have y i times log x i. So you see it's, yeah, this is, um, similar to an entropy, but what we have here is, a, you see, it's a, dif a difference. Uh, it's a difference in here and this kullback liebler uh, divergence or distance uh, can also be used. And if you look at these two uh, results, we again see that our network A is much better than network B. Uh. So this is a simple heuristic algorithm to produce uh, Bayesian networks. Uh, but if you look at realistic, somewhat bigger examples, it turns out that this algorithm and many similar algorithms do not produce good networks. I mean, these networks may be by far too big and the performance also is uh, not very good. Yeah. Um, one reason for this is that these algorithms do not have the intuition as you humans have, for example, for the variable ordering. If in the alarm example you use the wrong ordering of variables, if you have done this exercise, you have seen it. It's a very hard job if the order of the variables is bad. But who tells this algorithm which is the, the right order of the variables? Maybe it might ask the user, but then it's no longer fully automatic. But that might help and it would, it would become much better. Okay, but let's stop here and we continue with this issue, variable ordering, uh, tomorrow morning.